Well, Happy New Year's Eve. As we uh, get started this morning, I've got some fun, unanswerable questions for you. Favorite kind of question is an un- unanswerable question, right? First, is the opposite of the opposite the same? Or is it the opposite? If a vampire bites a zombie, does the zombie become a vampire? Does the vampire become a zombie? Unanswerable. Nobody knows. Is there a a discernible difference between ketchup and fancy ketchup? Or are we all just unwitting pawns in the grand ketchup wars? If you punch yourself and it hurts, are you weak or are you strong? How do you throw away a garbage can? Nobody knows. When bald people wash their face, how far up do they... Sorry, that was one too far. One too far. Welcome to the final week of Awaiting the Already, uh, where we're considering five different perspectives of Jesus' arrival through the lens of the four gospel writers who we've covered uh, over the last four weeks. And today, the Apostle Paul will be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. You feel free to turn there now if you'd like to follow along. Philippians chapter 2. I really wanted us during the holiday season this year to take a morning and really just kind of marvel at the deeper implications of the incarnation. You know, we spend a lot of Sundays giving our attention to a lot of different things, all good things, but rarely, rarely do we get to really sit with the deeper things of God, but we should, and we will today, because if for no other reason, it's good to remind ourselves of the depths of the beauty of what Jesus has done for us. Now, one thing that's worth saying as we uh, step into some uncharted territory today, I I, I just want to acknowledge that up front, that we're stepping into uncharted uh, territory. And it's why I started with several unanswerable questions, because we're going to run into some unanswerable questions Today, There are some topics, some ideas in Christian theology that are simply too deep for the human mind to exhaust. The incarnation of Christ, his paradoxical nature of being both fully God and fully man, what theologians call the hypostatic union, simply not something that we can truly wrap our minds around. And so many people say, well, I'll never understand it, so there's no point in thinking about it or talking about it. This is where we go wrong. First of all, I think there's something to be said for the good that it does our souls to spend a little time marveling at things that are beyond us. For us to really be confronted with ideas that go beyond our ability to explore is a good exercise in which we are reminded of how limited we are and how glorious God is. At the same time, I would argue that there is no idea within Christian theology or any other topic for that matter about which we can learn nothing. Now, will we solve the the mystery of the incarnation today? Certainly not. Can we all learn something new? And can that knowledge renew our appreciation for the depth of God's glory and lead us into a deeper longing to know him more? Certainly Today, we are like scuba divers swimming in one of the deepest oceans of the earth. Our oxygen tanks are far too limited to even come close to exhausting the depths. We could never, ever, ever reach the bottom, but we can still have a really fun time, see some amazing things, learn a lot, and be better for the experience. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So before we get too far into this, we should establish some basic parameters. First of all, the vast majority of Christian theological traditions believe in something called the Trinity. Now, some of this may be basic for a lot of you, but I just want to make sure we're all reading from the same page, so bear with me. Or this is a really rudimentary, uh, probably overly simplistic explanation of what the Trinity is. There is only one God. God exists in three persons, distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. They are all three distinct persons, one from another, and yet there is only one God. 
The doctrine of the Trinity can go much deeper and become more intricate than that, but that's a a very basic explanation, and this is essential to Orthodox Christian belief for almost 2,000 years now. So that's one uh, foundational doctrine we should all be in agreement on uh, as we get into Philippians 2. So Paul writes, Being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He was in very nature God. Paul is speaking of Christ's eternal existence, that before he became a man known as Jesus of Nazareth, he was the second person of the eternal triune God. He existed as the second part of the Godhead or the Trinity. This is the the same idea by which John began his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. So it was well established in the first century, and you can see it throughout the New Testament. This is observable through Scripture. The existence of Jesus did not begin when he was conceived in Mary's womb. He existed long before Mary. One day he was talking about his relationship with Abraham, and the Pharisees said, you are not yet 50 years old. You've seen Abraham. Very truly I tell you, he said, before Abraham was born... I am. And they tried to stone him. But it's clear from scripture that this is this being that we call Jesus existed even before the world began. And, 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 and Paul says that he was in very nature God. If you're reading a different uh, translation, yours may say form instead of nature there. The, the point Paul is making is that he was God before he became human. And in a staggering act of humility, he did not consider his nature as God something to be used to his own advantage, something that to be clung to, something he must protect for his own comfort or his own status or his own desire. He did not consider equality with God something to be leveraged to benefit him. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So what we're looking at right here, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, is Paul's version of Mark's, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Of Matthew's, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Of Luke's, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Of John's, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh. This is the Christmas story according to the Gospel of Paul. He was in very nature God, but did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a slave being made in human likeness. This is Paul's Christmas story. Now the translation here, we're reading from the NIV. The translation is off. Every version has its misses. And and in my opinion, the NIV missed it here. That phrase made himself nothing doesn't really capture what Paul meant to say. The Greek word here he uses is echinosin, which literally means he emptied himself. If you're reading the ESV, that's what you have in your translation, that uh, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That's the literal translation of what Paul wrote, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And whether Paul intended to, to infer a theological mystery or not, various scholars argue different ways, the fact is it has become one of the most theologically contested passages in the Bible. Jesus was in the form of God. He possessed the very nature of God. He was God. And then, not counting equality with God a thing to be clung to, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. And the question has often been asked, what did Jesus empty himself of? This question is at the center of a theological debate sometimes referred to as kenosis, not because of Obi-Wan Kenobi, unfortunately this concept has nothing to do with Star Wars, but because of the Greek word echinosin. He emptied himself. And the question follows, of what? Of what did he empty himself? And some scholars argue he didn't empty himself of anything. 
that Paul's speaking in pure metaphor, plain and simple, that, that he emptied himself, he poured himself out, humbled himself to, to nothing in becoming a servant. But others contend that Paul is speaking about the mechanisms of the incarnation here, that, that if Jesus emptied himself, it must be that he emptied himself of something. And for those who ask that question, there are really two schools of thought. One would be that Jesus emptied himself simply of his position, of his position. Now, Jesus obviously emptied himself of at least his position. He left heaven and came to earth. He left the throne of his eternal kingdom. He became a Jewish carpenter in Galilee. He emptied himself of no less than his position. That's clear. The proponents of this view, however, say that in taking on human nature, he did not lessen or diminish anything in his divine nature, that there was only an addition and not a subtraction, that his condescension to becoming a human being did not require, to his, of him, did not require him to ever be anything less than God, that his emptying was only of his environment not of his essence, that while being human and enduring all the real human experiences, he never ceased for a moment to be the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God. Now that view would mean that on the night Jesus was born, while possessing the brain of an infant, unable to speak, unable to think coherent thoughts, unable to lift his own head, confined to a manger, he was at the very same time upholding the universe by the word of his power, understanding all the deepest mysteries of creation and present with all people in all places throughout the earth. A supporter of this view, Pastor Kevin DeYoung, writes, Christ is all-knowing, and yet he learned things. He is omnipresent and yet in his body localized, all powerful and yet to some degree in his earthly life embraced finitude. Dr. DeYoung and those that share his view would say that all Christ ever emptied himself of were some of the divine privileges that came along with being the king of heaven and of his station there. The other position, the other school of thought in this debate is that Christ emptied himself of both his position and his power. His position and his power. Or to put it another way, in order to become truly human, it was necessary that he divest himself of the qualities that made him God that he set aside his divine attributes for a time, that his emptying was one not only of position and status, but of divine knowledge, of divine power, of divine presence, that all the things that would constitute divinity. Now, those that support this first, the first view would say that this view is dangerously close to heretically denying the divinity or the deity of Christ, so let me clarify that this second view does not claim that Christ ever ceased to be God in the same way that the first view would not claim that he did not truly become man. The man we call Jesus is the eternal divine son, the second person of the Trinity in nature and identity, fully God and fully man. Both sides would agree on this. But those that would argue for the second view would say that during the 33 years he lived on this earth, he willingly gave up the exercise of his divinity in order to live as nothing more than a human being, that he emptied himself of everything that made him God, not losing his divine nature or changing his identity as the divine son, but giving up for 33 years the divine attributes that only God enjoys. A supporter of this view, theologian Roger Olson, writes, the Son of God voluntarily set aside the attributes of glory and power in becoming incarnate as the man Jesus Christ, not using his attributes of glory and power or even knowing about them, except through revelation from his heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. These are the two primary positions on the question of Jesus' emptying. Each of them is a legitimate theological view, sustainable from Scripture, and each presents their own issues and paradoxes and theological quandaries. Wherever you land on this idea, or whether you take a position at all, it's good for us to ponder these things, 
to lean into the mystery, to remind ourselves of the beauty of what Jesus did, of what he is. Regardless of the details of how it happened, the shocking truth is that God became human. The divine son became a Jewish peasant. The word became flesh. As Augustine once wrote, he through whom time was made was made in time. And he, older by eternity than the world itself, was younger in age than many of his servants in the world. He who made man was made man. He was given existence by a mother whom he brought into existence. He was carried in hands which he formed. He nursed at breasts which he filled. He cried like a babe in the manger in speechless infancy. This word without which human eloquence is speechless. Man's maker was made man, that he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that truth might be accused of false witnesses, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. This is the scandalous nature of who Jesus is and what he's done. And we should never allow this to become cold to us. It must never feel old or tired. The incarnation of God should cause our soul to stir within us a little bit. It should move the deepest part of our being. It should threaten to raise a lump into our our throat. It should melt any hardness in our hearts away and stoke the fires of our affection for Jesus. Because here, right here among all the the claims of Christianity is what J.I. Packer calls the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation. Here is a love story of unparalleled magnitude. The creator of all things has violated the boundary between heaven and earth. He has stepped out of eternity and into time. He has confined himself in the existence of, of a human being. In the man Jesus of Nazareth, divinity and humanity have not visited one another. They have collided completely, irrevocably, and eternally. An event so unthinkable that the cosmos itself stood still in awe. That on the night he was born, the stars declared his arrival. Angels filled the night sky with singing. Mystical strangers set out to travel thousands of miles to worship him. It was as if the entire universe leaned in to witness the irreversible union of heaven and earth. The single greatest act of humility ever performed. God become man. And that's the true point that Paul is making in Philippians 2, that the incarnation is identification in its purest and most profound form, that in order to identify with humanity, God humbled himself to the degree with which humanity would never be able to identify. And there's irony here in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God a thing to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing, emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant. You know, every ambitious leader in the history of the world has desired to be God or become like God. That's always the ultimate temptation of pride, right? That was the temptation that's as old as the garden itself to be like God, to lay hold to the divine nature that we see as something to be used to our own advantages. Is this not true of every ambitious leader in the history of the world? And yet here's the real God 
all the power and the privileges of divinity in his grasp. What does he do? He empties himself. He steps off his throne. He chooses to condescend to a station infinitely beneath what he had eternally known. He chooses limitation. He chooses weakness, lowliness, poverty, hunger, fatigue, sorrow, grief, pain. He chooses death so that he might gift new life to those on whom death had laid hold. He has all power and all authority and all joy and all comfort. And for our sake, he trades it all for a manger and a cross. This is the humility of Christ. And to Paul's point, how can we, his people, who are called by his name, the name of Christian, do anything less with our lives than be molded in this same humility. Have this mindset in yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. As the calendar turns to 2024 and we set our focus on a new year, instead of making superficial resolutions, I would encourage you this year to resolve to embrace the mindset of Jesus. Self-sacrifice, humility, love. To practice the presence of God in your daily life. To make it a priority to be with Jesus. To become like Jesus. To do what Jesus did that we might be people not just known by his name, but by his heart and his character, now incarnate in our own lives. This is our calling, our purpose, our privilege as followers of the one who emptied himself for our sake. Let us empty ourselves, be filled with his spirit. Your questions for reflection and discussion this week. What do you believe Christ emptied himself of? Why? In what way does the incarnation inspire you? And how will you embody the spirit of the incarnation in your own life this year? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege to study your word to consider these things that are beyond us, to dip our toes, as it were, into these deep, deep waters. God, I pray that you would take our time this morning and that you would use it in each of our lives, that we might come to know you more, that we might have a deeper appreciation of your heart and your character and the humility of what you have done for us. God, I pray that that would take root in us, that it would produce fruit, the fruit of humility as displayed in Christ Jesus. It's in his name 